So we're here at the EFAS. So who are you? My name is Paul Gray. I'm a TV technology analyst for Display Search. So. Uh, so what, what does Display Search do? Uh, we research the display business and the whole of the display business from the people who melt sand into sheets of glass all the way through panel making and the components and equipment used to make it through to finished products. So uh, how many big screen makers are there in the world? Um, so depending on, on what technologies you count, there are something like seven major panel manufacturers worldwide. So like two in uh, South Korea? So in South Korea you have uh, Samsung Display and LG Display. In Japan you have Panasonic making uh, Plasma and you have Sharp making LCD. Uh, and then in Taiwan you have AUO and CMI. So uh, what's going on with them? Are they losing money? Uh, last right year was a horrible year for the display business and everybody was losing money. Um, this is part of a business cycle that uh, you have a, a heartbeat of investment and overcapacity. And last year we were in serious overcapacity and as a result then people lose money. It's a capital intensive business. You have to fill your fabs to make money. It's hundreds of billions of dollars, right? Correct. Is it thousands of billions of dollars? Uh, we're not in thousands of billions of dollars, but uh, to build a new panel fab costs you something like two, two billion dollars, excluding the R&D that you need to do to, to, uh, to, to create panels. So is it Samsung number one? Uh, Samsung is number one. Of course, people can think of different uh, measures of how to be number one. Samsung is a broad player. It's in OLED and plasma and LCD and they make huge areas. Um, all the panel makers tend to have some slightly different specialisms, so some will be more orientated towards monitors, other ones towards TVs or mobile. So lots of people are number one at different parts of the business. But if Samsung is kind of number one, the number one is losing money as well. Correct. Last year, even the number one managed to lose money as well. That's a kind of a special business where that happens. So what did they need to do to fix that uh, whole losing money thing? Essentially, then, the first thing you have to do is stop cutting prices faster than you cut costs. And especially in the TV business, then people had five years of cutting their retail prices faster than they cut costs. Um, the other one is a change in mindset where you stop using price to drive increased volumes and you stop and you start adding value to consumers and holding your prices or just saying, you know, what's the point of selling more and more products um, at a loss? You know, it's, it's, just a, it's just an opportunity to lose more and more money the more successful you are at selling. So how, many, how much money did they lose on the 3D? Um, experiment, the 3D idea. The 3D experiment is not yet, not yet over. We see more and more 3D TVs shipping. Um, 3D is intimately tied up with lots of other features. So if, for example, you're making a, uh, a 120 or 100 hertz or 200 hertz TV, then the 3D doesn't actually cost very much extra. So I don't think you can say that 3D on its own has a cost attached to it. It's part of a value package that you offer consumers. Um, and certainly in Western Europe and China, consumers want a 3D capability in their TV. They may not watch much 3D at the moment, but it has value for them and they're prepared to buy it. Um, in North America, consumers feel very differently. They want sparsely featured, very big sets, and they'll put all their money towards featuring, all their money towards, sorry, screen size rather than featuring. So one of the coolest things I, I see at trade shows is a Quad HD, yeah. four-time HD. They've been showing it for three, four, five years, you know, it's so awesome. What's, uh, how much does it cost to make a TV Quad HD? Uh, it costs a lot, so uh, it, depending on how, how set makers do it, it, it gives you the answer on, uh, on their costs. However, um, in terms of the video processing, you need four times the memory straight away. So the amount of DRAM you have in a set goes up by a factor of four. You need a much bigger video pipe just to push all those extra pixels through and process them. Something like a factor of four. That's not on the display, right? It's just no, this is all the stuff in it's the electronics. electronics before you get to the display. Yeah. Uh, the displays are very immature at the moment. So um, the yields are not yet mature. They have not made large numbers of them. And at the moment, then therefore, it, it's, it's unrepresentative to say that because they're not made fully optimized. Um, it will always cost extra. 
there's no doubting that. You have smaller pixels, and that means they're more likely to see dead pixels and so on. But a lot of the cost burden is in signal processing. Does it matter if they're dead pixels? Yes. It acts, we, do you, would, you buy, would you spend 5,000 euros on a TV with dead pixels you can see on it? it's tiny. The, the pixels are tiny. Consumers don't have other TVs with dead pixels. Why buy a premium product with dead pixels? You don't want it. It has to it. have zero dead pixels. It has to have zero no, dead pixels. And, and, you know, an ordinary TV you buy in retail doesn't have visible dead pixels anymore. You know, that was five, six, seven years ago. They're not like that now. And so these things, you know, are part of bringing a product to maturity. Can't you just have a dead pixel be black or something so it doesn't really bother? Uh, it will always be invisible. Once, you, you probably, like me, had a PC that's had a dead pixel on it. And it's one of those things, it's kind of like something that you scratch and you keep going to it and you know it's there. And at the low end, that's okay, but 4K, 2K, and OLED and things like that are premium products. You know, would you buy a BMW with a scratch on it? <laughs> New. No. no, okay. <laughs> no. And, and it's like that. You know. But if it's five times cheaper, I would say yes. Oh, maybe course. you have a negotiation with the dealer, but um, you know, that doesn't support the value proposition of, of a high-end product. So the electronics, like the DRAM stuff, it sounds to me like it could be easy because it's so many years ago that 1080p was a standard. But how about the display? How much is new in terms of making the whole display? It's between actually, Quad HD and 1080. For, for, uh, for 4K 2K, it is not just a simple scaling. Um, there is a technology shift involved. And one of the things you may have noticed is that at the moment, 4K 2K panels are not available that do more than 120 hertz. Okay, there's a good reason for that. And that is to... Um, to get that many pixels, you have to have thinner and thinner tracks on the panel to switch those pixels on and off. And you start getting losses in the tracks, and you have to change the technology of the conductor. It's exactly the same technology step as uh, you've seen on iPad 3 to go to that very, very high pixel density. And it's not yet in production, it's not yet mature, people are still working on it. Um, and so we need actually quite a big innovation breakthrough to get to the new st stage for 4K, 2K to be a mature product. Um, and people have to master that. You'll see it on Sharp's booth, it's called IGZO, um, and it's also known as Oxide TFT. And when Oxide TFT is mature, then we start seeing the platform for 4K, 2K really being built out. Can it be soon? Can we get $2,000, 55 inch 4K, 2K next year, or that's impossible? Uh, I think it takes longer than that to be industrialized. This is about process engineers working away, scratching in 1%, 1%, 1%, and then you get that. This is a process development issue. Um, this is not just a, uh, a simple shrink it, on an IC. It's not political. It's not because the companies think, ah, we'll wait, we'll sell 3D now, we'll do the 4K uh, later. How, how many uh, big brands had a 4K, 2K uh, this week? So. Panasonic had it, Sony had it, LG had it, Sharp had it, Samsung had it, you know, Toshiba's got it. The technology is coming, but it's not there yet. And, you know, those panels are still costly and they're made in small quantities. So it's going to take how many years? $2,000, 55-inch? Um, I don't think you're going to see 4K, 2K in big volumes. And when I say big volumes, say let's say a couple of million in, in a region like Western Europe for another three or four years. It's not too long. It's next World Cup. Maybe, maybe yeah. when you next replace your next TV. Okay. But after that, you've got to have the content built out with it. You've got to have 4K, 2K cameras and a broadcasting chain, and that's going to take a lot longer. A lot, lot longer. The broadcasters have just refitted all their studios and production chains in HD. If you want to transmit it terrestrially or on satellite, MPEG-4, you either have four times the data rate or you go to a new form of compression. That new form of compression is HEVC. The standard is not yet finalized. We're getting close, but it's not even going to exist until next year as a finalized standard. Then people have to develop chips and software to go with it. So three years at least before we first start seeing the, uh, the possibility. I just like putting my SD card in the 4K screen here and seeing my home family pictures. Yeah. 8 megapixel, it's, I faint every time I see it. And it's I nice. think just the slideshow for 8 megapixel pictures is a market. If you sit close enough. But for some people then obviously there, there's a market for it. 
I think we're beginning to see a pixel war breaking out in the uh, in the PC industry with Apple starting to increase the pixel density. Um, and it'll be interesting to see not only the PC industry but the gaming industry whether they start going on it. I, I think there's some really interesting things you can do, but I think if there's one lesson from 3D is that hardware is only half the story and the other half of the story is content and you've got to get the content right to add value to the hardware.